So at you know uh, the Paul University, I offer a course on Buddhism, and I try to in include uh, Korean Buddhism um, as a you know crucial part. But if you look at other um, scholars in our field, often when you say East Asian Buddhism, Korea is often omitted. Korea is never really mentioned. And um, so I wanted to be corrective to that situation and wanted to bring as much as Korean Buddhism, but as June will totally agree with me, there are not <laughs> any uh, textual references or um, good textbooks to rely on or any, you know, there are only a couple of uh, materials that we can rely and you utilize in the classroom discussions, but there are very little. So that has been, so although there are a lot of uh, motivations to include Korean Buddhism in our teaching materials, there are a lot of limitation. Uh, market principles um, really do dictate, uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, because I think everything that we study has inherent value, but uh, market principles are hard to ignore. Um, you know, uh, it's supply and demand. Uh, there's not a lot of demand. And in the case of Korean Buddhism, there's not a lot of uh, supply either. Um, the number of people who can claim that they uh, are experts of Korean Buddhism here in the United States, for example, it's really uh, small in comparison to um, uh, the you know, Buddhism of other areas like China and Japan, for example. Mm. And most of us, uh, me included, who do actually study Korean Buddhism, we also tend to um, specialize in other areas as well. Given the tendency uh, to sort of overlook Korean Buddhism, uh, scholarship hasn't really developed, uh, mm. as, uh, you know, as much as uh, our neighboring countries. And uh, as a consequence, it's become very difficult and it still remains very difficult to actually teach it um, because as Sujung noted, there's not a lot of material that we can use to, to teach this, uh, uh, this fascinating subject. you know, there's a Chinese tradition um, and that it was transplanted to Korea. And that's usually how it's understood. In fact, uh, in relation to our first question about why um, so few people come into the study of Korean Buddhism, um, it's one reason is because of this underlying assumption that you can pretty much understand what's going on and especially pre-modern Korean Buddhism if you just study Chinese Buddhism because Korean Buddhism is just a facsimile copy of it, which of course is absurdly uh, uh, wrong and not true. Um, the other problem is, well, if we don't use the transplant, uh, transplantation model, then what model are we going to use? And if you mm -hmm. look at, you know, the scholarship from the 19, you know, 50s onwards, it's really been an effort to do precisely that, to find a model that could replace or displace the transplantation model. People are still stuck in this uh, transmission model from Buddhism being from India to China, China to Korea, Korea to Japan. And that has been a lot of creating, um, to me, a very simplistic, lineal um, narrative about how things developed, right? There are a lot of um, counter or, you know, circular uh, movements within this uh, transmission. And often people are so trapped in this very national uh, nation state model. And we have this great tradition in this particular region and state. So that's what another thing that I wanted to be um, bring up in my uh, work and try to dismantle this nation state um, model that we all scholars um, unconsciously, um, you know, internalize and uh, present in our scholarship. Yeah, I think what is interesting is Korean scholars often think too much about um, China, about <laughs> inheritance, and they took they take too serious about Japanese scholarship. They're very sort of double standard against Japanese scholarship, I think. On the one hand, they want to overcome and often very uh, overcorrective to what Japanese scholars say. But at the same time, they are very much eager to learn. Majority of Korean uh, Buddhist scholars who want to get advanced degrees, they, go, they choose Japan. Mm -hmm. to study uh, philological and doctrinal aspects of um, Korean Buddhism. What they learn mm -hmm. is really of heavily influenced by Japanese way of thinking uh, yeah. and Buddhist history. So yeah. 
especially China, Buddhism. Exactly. So China and Japan are too big vis-a-vis -vis Korean, uh, how Korean yeah. sees themselves. That inadvertently uh, um, shaped really the, the discourse of uh, Korean Buddhism and Korean Buddhist scholarship mm -hmm. for many, many decades. And Su Jung is absolutely correct. Like right now, um, if you look at the scholarship that's been coming out since the 19, I guess, 60s onwards, uh, for almost a steady 40, 50 years, it's really been nothing but Korean Buddhist scholars both adopting almost uh, um, uh, completely um, without any sort of critical distance what the Japanese scholars have been doing because that's really been their source of inspiration, right? And on the, on the other hand, explicitly rejecting the claims of Japanese scholars. So on the one hand, you're being colonized, if I can uh, yeah, use yeah, that yeah. word here, um, at the level of models and consciousness, but uh, on the level of the, the specificity of the arguments, right? Um, uh, they're willing to disagree and reject uh, yeah. colonization. After, um, you know, the establishment of this big uh, Buddhist order, Joge order, um, after the present Lee, Lee Sing Man, um, it kind of create very blur, uh, conflict, conflation between academic studies of Buddhism and uh, Buddhist monks and nuns uh, ah. trying to learning to deepen their faith. And these two should be separated, but in Korea, somehow they find a way to mix the two together. I'm going to use what uh, some people may think is a very inappropriate analogy here, but, you know, some people say, well, can women uh, or should women do women's studies? Wouldn't it be biased? Should African-Americans uh, do African-American studies? Wouldn't that be biased? And of course, nobody really thinks this. In fact, the vast majority of people who do actually African-American studies and women's studies belong to those particular social groups, right? Um, but when it comes to people who study religion, well, if you're a Buddhist and you do Buddhist, uh, Buddhist studies, if you're a Christian and you study, you know, Christianity, which is actually most of the, uh, most of the time, right? Uh, uh, true. Um, then you can't be objective. Well, you know, to me, I think, uh, the, when you start thinking about it in these terms, the absurdity of the, of the question becomes very apparent. But it's also not just absurd, but also very important at the same time. Because we do want to say, well, you know, uh, it's not whether we can create a distance uh, or the so-called objective distance. I think we can. But I think it's far more important that we actually interrogate it rather than just assume that it's possible in certain disciplines, whereas it's not uh, possible mm -hmm. in other disciplines. And uh, again, the, probably the more controversial claim is, you know, the whole subaltern thing comes to mind. But uh, just to look at Korean studies, um, should Korean studies be done only by Koreans, right? Be it, you know, in Europe or here, here in the United States. And it is true that a lot of people who um, uh, specialize in Korean studies are of Korean descent, but that's not you know, necessarily, you know, 100% uh, tr uh, true. There, there are many scholars who aren't of Korean descent who do Korean studies. Um, do we think that there's a qualitative difference between, you know, the scholarship between, uh, produced by these two, uh, two groups? Um, I don't think there is, uh, but it's worth thinking about though. Um, going back to the, you know, the sort of um, the rupture between Korean Buddhism scholars in Korea and, you know, the, you know, other uh, scholars like Jun and me uh, who study Korean Buddhism outside Korean uh, academic contexts. So there's this uh, unbridgeable gap, um, not only about the ownership question, who owns this, the past, mm -hmm. but also who can do right, right? This right. becomes a very um, a big part of this uh, power dynamics. And once, uh, several years ago, I was still uh, in grad school and I had a chance, to, uh, I was um, traveling to Korea then and I was having some dinner with some a bunch of Korean Buddhism scholars. And there was one professor extremely towering historian, you know, I don't want to name him, <laughs> he passed away. 
And I, you know, was so nervously, you know, presenting what I'm studying, what I'm writing about at Columbia. And after hearing that, he kind of nodding, nodding. And when I finished my short presentation about my topic, he said, that's not Buddhism. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's not how, you know, uh, Buddhist studies should be. So there was, and I kind of, you know, nodded, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> get a sense that, you know, in at least older generation where some people in Korean uh, academia, very clear um, self-defined model. This is what we do and this is what it should be. And mm -hmm. I think that is another big hurdle uh, for the scholarship to move forward. Yeah. I think Sujong makes a really, really good point here. That, that the, the problem that Sujong just identified that's really what's uh, making it impossible for Korean Buddhist, the field of Korean Buddhism, um, or maybe even Korean studies, to be honest, to to really grow and and, um, and have wings. It's it's a really big problem. There's a tendency to, uh, so ownership is actually the more deeper problem. Um, and, uh, you know, in Korea, ownership revolves around these weird kind of intellectual family trees. So there's a professor, there's disciples, and it's very kind of insular in the sense that whatever the teacher's studying, all of his disciples pretty much uh, are, remain in that orbit. And the arguments too, they, they don't really um, uh, break out of the established mold, which is really the problem, right? Um, and that's and that further feeds into the seniority problem because the ultimate authority is always going to uh, rest in the person who in, uh, basically founded that uh, you know small subfield, um, and that would be the teacher. And you know the disciples would necessarily uh, build more uh, branches on top of the big trunk established by the teacher, but they themselves would never uh, you know. Um, break out and, and break, uh, you know, build their own forest elsewhere, right? If you were to encourage the next generation of, you know, scholars, right? Um, people who are starting their PhDs and or about to complete them, um, what would you recommend that they do in terms of exploring um, larger questions of, about uh, religion and, um, and Buddhism in Korea? What I would recommend to the future generation would be something um, that is based on my own experience. And to me, it worked well um, to making a detour, in other words, to come to Korea. In other words, I kind of converted to Japanese Buddhism <laughs> and, you know, um, I don't necessarily want to label my dissertation or my book eventually became um, as a Japanese Buddhism because, you know, it talks a lot about Korea and also talks a lot about China as well. Um, but what I'm um, seeing it, um, just like, you know, uh, June, what you did, you know, studying, uh, you know, trans sickness and kind of arriving from that angle to Korea. I think there will be, it takes longer time and efforts, but I think there will be really uh, one practical way to um, relate Korean Buddhism to the more um, 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 neighboring disciplines and uh, broadening perspective so that we are not trapped in very, you know, small insular uh, perspective to uh, create a narrative about what Korean Buddhism is. Uh, one of the great things about working in the field of Korean studies is that um, the, and this is me trying to, to praise uh, uh, our brothers and sisters in Korea, um, uh, there, there's a lot of um, support, fi especially financial support that comes from Korea. And it's at vital to our success and our survival, right, in academia. And, um, you know, on, on many of these initiatives um, that's supported by, you know, places like KF and, and AKS, um, it's, it's about, you know, helping students uh, in PhD programs um, uh, develop uh, theses and, and, you know, future projects uh, that could further uh, and, and develop and really promote the field of Korean studies in a way that would 
uh, make us less insular. So um, I think that there are some really smart people um, trying to make sure that that this happens. And so that's that's one thing that I you know recently I've I've been hoping to have more dialogue and conversation. Uh, with other scholars in Korean studies uh, here in the United States and Europe about, and that is, you know, we all recognize the uh, the insularity of our field, and we all in our own ways are working to overcome it, uh, but what specifically should we be doing um, to ensure that, you know, the next generation of scholars can have an advantage uh, that would make it so much easier, much uh, more feasible, uh, to to reach those goals because we all know it's uh, it's re it's been really difficult to do that in our generation right uh, way too many hurdles and and that's made it uh, a little too painful for us to sort of um, trend, move in that direction but for the next generation I think it's it's a it's a much brighter road ahead.